Hi, everyone. Welcome to Project Herpetoculture Podcast. I'm your host, Roy Arthur Blodgett, and I'm joined, as always, by my intrepid co-host, Philip Leitz of Arids Only. We have an excellent show for you today, but before diving in, we have some brief housekeeping. So first, I'd like to thank Dylan and the Animals at Home Network for hosting our show. It continues to be a pleasure to be part of this platform. We'd also like to extend special gratitude to Charlie, who generously edits our audio and has done a lot to improve the quality of our show over time. And we'd also like to take a moment to tell you about our sponsors. So first, we have Custom Reptile Habitats, who have been with us since day one. They produce top-of-the-line PVC reptile enclosures, and I use them for a lot of the large format vivaria here. They're also carrying universal rocks, misking products, and a bunch of other useful stuff. So if you're in the market for any of that and you're planning to make a purchase, consider doing so through the link in our bio or description. We'll receive a small commission at no additional cost to you, and that really helps us keep the lights on over here. Up next, we have Fairy Tale Dragons. That's have a joint uh, venture between Heather Moy and Ron St. Pierre, both of whom have achieved legendary status in herpetoculture. They've accomplished quite a lot and produced some of the finest bearded dragons in Taliqua in the country, alongside a whole host of other species, species such as emerald tree boas and green tree pythons. Check them out if you're in the market for any of that, and be sure to follow along with them on social media. They're always up to something interesting over there. Next, we have cold-blooded caffeine, roasters of delicious coffees from all over the globe. We have a private label with them, the PH Blend, which is a light roast coffee from Rwanda. It's a great choice for those who prefer a more floral coffee with notes of berry, but they have a wide variety of options for a broad array of preferences. So check them out. And if you place an order, don't forget to use the code Project Herp for 10% off. We're also very pleased to have the support of Exoterra, a brand that needs no introduction. It's safe to say that herpetoculture wouldn't be where it is today without the influence of Exoterra. For decades, they've been industry leaders in innovation, offering just about everything needed for reptile care, from diets and supplements to enclosures, substrates, and lighting. We're both big fans of their naturalistic terraria and substrates in particular. They have a lot of interesting products in the works as we speak, and we're really looking forward to seeing what comes next. And next, we have Tamura Designs. For those in the know, Tamura Designs is widely regarded as one of the finest enclosure manufacturers on the planet. They produce outstanding, large-format vivaria with endless options for customization, drains, UV-printed backgrounds, lighting rigs. On, to, on top of all of that, they also make amazing deli cup displays for expos and these incredible multi-unit condos, which I use here. So if you're interested in any of that and you decide to make a purchase, Use the code HERPETOCULTURE for 15% off one item as a special offer to our listeners only. We also have Happy Dragons. We're really thankful to have the support of Happy Dragons. They are producing some amazing content for uh, bettering our reptile care. And we've been actually partnering with them to produce even more content like webinars. Um, also, the platform and subscription service offers breeder access to um, first clutches, things like that, that we have online courses coming down the pipeline. In addition, we have live Q and A's with reptile experts, such as Mariah Healy from Reptophiles. It's truly an outstanding um, subscription package um, that also offers discounts on um, their supply partners, such as Ovapost and Joss Joss's Frogs. It's really an outstanding product, so check it out and um, let us know what you think. And last but not least, if you're interested in supporting the show directly with something of a tip or a monthly donation, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash project herpetoculture. We have a monthly live chat there with all of our paid subscribers. That's been a whole lot of fun so far. Uh, We also have a whole line of merchandise like t-shirts, mugs, pint glasses, and more on our website. And of course, sharing the show with a friend, subscribing on YouTube, and keeping up with social media is always very helpful. And with all that said, we're on to the show. Thanks, everybody. All right. I think we are live. Here we are. This is Project Herpetal Culture Podcast, episode 76, with Summer Winston from the shop. Hey, Summer, hey, how's y'all. it going? Pretty good, man. Pretty good. Happy to be here. <laughs> Super stoked you're here, too. This is fun. Usually we get to hang out face to face, but yeah, now we get to do this, so... Yeah. <laughs> Digital world right, between well, us. <laughs> um, I mean, 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. We're both just like in these amorphous spaces too. It's funny. But um, anyway, um, so yeah, to begin, I'd love to hear a little bit about your background and how you got started in herpetoculture. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, for sure. So I'm originally from Louisiana, uh, like deep south swamp Louisiana. And so it's just kind of, we just coexist. Like I've spent my most of my life just coexisting with reptiles. Um, you go outside, there's like snakes pretty visible in different places, lots of frogs, lots of geckos, just everywhere. I jokingly tell my friends, but it's not a joke that I've had to stop multiple times for alligators crossing the road <laughs> when I'm like driving my car. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool existence, you know? And like when my mom is really, uh, she's really into fishing. So when we go fishing, my job was to like relocate any turtles that got on the hook. So I was, so I've always been really like fond of turtles because I just, I felt like I had this sacred task of like taking them to safety <laughs> away from her hook. And then also like getting them back into the water before any random folks drove by and asked if they could have the turtle. They turn into turtle sauce pecan and I'm like, yeah. So, so yeah, growing up in South Louisiana, it was just a part of the culture. Um, there's been many days that I was like chilling by a bayou front and there's also alligators around. Like it's just a part of life, you know? And I moved to California. I've been in California for eight years, almost nine years. And about five years ago, a friend of mine, or not even that long, like four years ago, a friend of mine was like, hey, you want to go to a reptile store with me? And I was like, a what? <laughs> yes yeah I want to do that I want to go to a reptile store and I went to the reptile store I saw a panther chameleon for the first time in my life and I was like that is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen it's amazing so I started researching them and I just went into this deep rabbit hole of like learning everything I could about them um and then I got my first panther chameleon and then my first bearded dragon, then my second and third and fourth bearded <laughs> chameleon. And it just, it just exploded from there. <laughs> I just like, I never, I grew up like, oh, like dogs are pets, cats are pets, reptiles are like wild animals that are in our ecosystem. But it never dawned on me like they could be pets. I, I did live with the, we did live with the cotton mouth for a short period of time. Um, there was in our apartment complex, uh, there's, there was like a, um, what do you call it? Like a, a reservoir, uh, like next to our apartment complex. And this cotton mouth was stretched out underneath the overhang of our laundry mat. And like the kids, us, I was like seven at the time. Uh, we would ride our bikes around the laundromat and we didn't even notice it. And my mom's boyfriend at the time noticed it. And he was just like, holy crap, like one of the kids are going to get bit if they keep riding our bikes around there like that. So he didn't want to kill it. And he didn't know what else to do with it. He's like, if I put it back in the reservoir, it's just going to come back over here. So the natural solution, he put it in a 75-gallon tank. <laughs> <laughs> in our living room. <laughs> nice. So, so he lives with us for a few months. And then my mom caught me a few times, like messing with the lid. And she finally demanded that it had, she's like, it has to go. It cannot like that kid is too curious. I keep catching her messing with the enclosure. Like it, you, it has, that snake has to get out of here. So, so yeah, so I did live with him for a bit. And, uh, and my mom had fish tanks. She had like a 75 gallon with like Oscars and like a Paku and some other stuff in there. So, yeah. Awesome. I love yeah. that. Yeah. You know, it's like safer just in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, this is the, <laughs> this is the solution. 
like the kids will <laughs> accidentally run over it with their bikes and get bit and like it's still alive so in the house that's, yeah that's the no, i love it i love it it sounds like the kind of like rationality that i would have applied when i was like a teenager that really wanted to like take home a rattlesnake that I found, you know. <laughs> it's like I'm, I'm like, oh, saving it's, it's it. Safer it's, here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's its that. life is safe. Human lives are safe. It's perfect. <laughs> so, so like in this trajectory, I mean, obviously you're 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 talking about how like it happened, like you got you know a panther chameleon, and then it was just like brrr, you know off to the races. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I'm curious, like like what about it like was so like like gripped you if you can if you can mm. speak to that like hooked you in yeah. in that way and also like when did it start to become a thing for you where it was like okay this is like i'm doing this this is like yeah. gonna be part of my life yeah um i would say so I did a lot of research before I got the Panther Chameleon and I'm a geek, like I'm a total geek and I love researching things. It's like one of my, it, I just love it. So I think that part without me, like realizing it at the time, like that was really appealing to me, like having to research and learn about the animals and like also getting to learn about these different places that I never really think about. So like reading about Mad Madagascar and like looking up like nosy, the nosy region, like on a map and like figuring, cause like the first locale that I, well, actually the only really only locale that I, I keep in kept are the nosy folly, nosy Faley. I'm not sure how people say that. I don't, fully think it matters <laughs> but yeah. um so yeah just like yeah researching so a, a part of it was the the researching that it felt like I'm in I felt like I was embarking on like a science experiment and I really like I really enjoyed that part of it uh my brain I'm like problem solving really makes my brain happy and getting the chameleon and really like getting the param trying to get the parameters correct for the chameleon because I was also really nervous. I saw lots of videos that were like panther chameleons are not good first reptile pets and like panther chameleons are so difficult. So I was really nervous. And so the process of trying to get the parameters correct in the enclosure, uh, I built their enclosure from scratch, what was another thing that I really like really hooked me because I'm a builder. I love, I love building things and working with my hands. Um, so yeah, I fine tuning, tweaking, like dimming, making the lights a little brighter, making them a little dark, like trying to get the temperature gradient correct and trying to get the humidity to stick. Like right out the gate, I went bioactive. So mm. My first enclosure for my first reptile, I built it. It went bioactive out the gate. <laughs> and like, I'm like, this is the best way to get the humidity where I need it to be. I, there's no other option. I have to go bioactive. <laughs> so I've actually, I've actually never kept, I've never kept any reptile not bioactive. <laughs> Mm -hmm. like yeah. at, like all my enclosures at home most of the enclosures at the store except for like the ones that the babies are in uh like yeah so so yeah it was the science that pulled me in and then I'm also like my background is in art so I have like my bachelor's of fine arts and at MA, at MFA master's of fine arts and so I was really attracted to the aesthetics of the reptiles as well and so yeah, it was just a, it was all my favorite things, aesthetics, I love that. science, yeah. building things. I, yeah, I was, I was doomed. <laughs> yeah, <is> no, yeah. <laughs> very so, relatable. I feel like all of those same things are part of what makes it so inescapable for me as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I feel like yeah, I feel like it's cool to to hear about like. Yeah, just your your arts background and like mm -hmm. I'm curious. I mean, we like Phil and I on the show, we're always talking about like herpetoculture as an art 
you know, as oh, like a, yeah. as an art practice. And I'm curious if you have mm-hmm. any thoughts about that and like what what you would you would have to say about that, as, like framing it as an art. Oh, yeah, it absolutely is. Like I so like my background is in graphic design and branding as well as photography. And but like I've also done like lots of like a lot of my work that I've done has been like installation art and like interactive installation art uh, and like which also like dip my toes into sculpture as well. And so when I'm building out, like when I'm terrascaping the inside of a enclosure, a lot of it feels like sculpture and I'm thinking about composition and like, I'm thinking about the way that the light is going to hit what, when, and mm-hmm. it's, yeah, it's definitely like a lot of the thought, pro- like I'll sketch out my designs before I start uh, actually working inside the space. So a lot of the process-based practices that I implement when I'm making art is the same things that I do when I'm building out an enclosure space. So yeah, absolutely. And it also like satisfies my brain in a very similar way. Like the act of terrascaping satisfies Mm -hmm. my brain in a lot of the same ways that the act of like, drawing or like creating some diorama to photograph later (laughs) like Uh, yeah so yeah I totally get that yeah there's this like I don't know when this book came out but it's kind of like an art like an art school classic it's like drawing on the right side of the brain do you know Uh, that book (laughs) yeah I remember I remember when Catherine and I were like teenagers, you know, we were reading that book together because we were both, you know, we we were we we were into art and yeah. um and I think about that like I I think about how often I feel like when I'm really dropped in like working on a on, an, on a new build or even just tending yeah. to the animals um mm-hmm. like it really it's a similar kind of spot for me to when I'm like really dropped in with a drawing or something like that. Yeah. So it's cool to yeah. hear that from you as well. Yeah. That um, book's like the, like the OG goat. <laughs> yeah. <drawing> totally. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, I haven't, so I kind of want to like reread it now, you know, it's been literally mm-hmm. like 15 years since I've, yeah. I've looked at that book, but um, yeah, I have a copy of it in my office at work. <laughs> nice. I love it. That's so cool. Yeah. I, mean, I didn't know if it was still still around, you know, still uh, yeah. accepted, but yeah. Um, yeah, the copy I have is like it's like oh like the pages are a little yellow. <laughs> like like I've had it for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think even the copies that we had back then were like old used copies at that point, you know. Yeah. But um, that's so funny. Um, Yeah, I kind of like lost my train of thought there. But I don't know. It's just really cool. It's really refreshing to hear like, yeah, just like it framed as an art practice. And I guess one thing I'm curious about with that is like in your initial, like you're talking about the research phase that you, you know, were initially when and that was like part of what hooked you as well. But also like, you know, the process of like, doing escape and um in art and all that you're drawing on like kind of similar things and i'm curious like what like what were kind of like the primary resources you were like going toward um initially like was it mostly like through like youtube and like online stuff yeah. or was it more really like leaning more on books or it was just like everything what what was mm-hmm. it for you so i was watching uh i was watching a lot of youtube videos and i quickly realized that I was like, I can't trust this source (laughs) because some like videos would like directly contradict each other. And I was like, okay, I don't know what's right and what's wrong. Um, And then I found my way to the chameleon forums. And Mm. like to this day, I feel like the chameleon forums is one of the healthiest uh, online like community spaces, like in all my time of like actively interacting with that space, there wasn't a moment where like, I'll see like in some Facebook groups where people will ask a question and then someone or a couple of someone's will come in like, oh, you're so dumb, blah, 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 blah. 
but like that wasn't happening at all. And, and I'm like, I'm not as active in that space as I used to be, but the chameleon forums were like super helpful in terms of asking questions and learning. Like I'd find I'd watch some videos or like read an article or two, and then I'd go there and I'm like, Hey, like I read this article, it said this, or I watched this video. Is this true? Is this accurate? And so like I built a little community space there when I was really active. But then I found my way to my friend, Bill Strand, and I love Bill so yeah. much. He's just, yeah. I And so I found my way to Bill and his wealth of resources around chameleons. He just like giving him his roses right now. He just does mm-hmm. such a great job of putting educational content out about different chameleon species in a way that's so uh, accessible. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like the information is so accessible. It's not like filled with scientific names that can get a little bit jarring for a new person. It's yeah. And so I appreciate, I appreciate Bill a, a great deal. And especially now, like over the years, like getting to know him, like on more of a friendship level. And I'm just like, I remember the first time I met him, I was like, so star struck. And I don't do that. Like, I don't, there's like, I don't really fan out over people too much. But like, when I met Bill, I was, and like, he knew who I was, and Yvette knew who I was, his wife. And I was just like, mm-hmm. okay, yeah. <laughs> so it was, so it was a lot of that. It was like YouTube videos. And then I would also, uh, I would read like white papers too. Mm-hmm. And so I was reading like whatever white papers I could find and then the chameleon forum and uh, everything that Bill, I just, just ate up everything Bill put out there watching all his videos and yeah, all of that. Yeah. Bill is, he's a, he's a, he's such an asset to the herpetoculture community yeah. just in every mm-hmm. way, just like such a positive, yeah. um, knowledgeable, generous, like, and yeah. and yeah and skillful like i think that yeah. like really what you're speaking to around the way that he presents information it's like mm-hmm. i feel like he presents it at all levels too where it's like there's he, he's got really good solid basics coverage but like if you want to get really granular and nerdy about like yeah. the intricacies of fogging and stuff like yeah. that it's like he's got you covered <laughs> you know? yeah it's true which is so cool and like yeah, just just uh, I totally totally would um, co-sign that endorsement of like the quality yeah. that he's putting out there and just how much he contributes. Um, yeah, very cool, very cool. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and I didn't, um, I wasn't aware of like I not yet at that point, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I naturalist is oh, a godsend, especially since you have like taught me better ways to use it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah. That's my favorite thing, just geeking out on iNaturalist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there will be a lot more about that on here on Happy Dragons Plus in the future. But um, yeah. But yeah, so, okay. I mean, we got to talk about the shop, obviously. Yes. But I'm curious about like, what was like the inception of the shop? Like, <laughs> like was it was there a moment like where you were like okay I want to do reptiles but I want to I want to do breeding maybe and then yeah. you were like I kind of want to actually also open a shop or how yeah. did like how how did the trajectory happen Yeah was it there from the beginning So so the shop in and of itself wasn't there in the beginning but kind of it was like, I, so this is going to uh-huh. probably sound weird. I don't know why, but since I was like 15, I've always wanted a store, like, mm-hmm. like a space where like, and it's, it's existed like this, this idea has existed in many forms over the years. Like I wanted it to be like a gallery space at one point where we held like live music sessions and all, and also like was selling like streetwear and stuff like, like that and like fly sneakers. So it's like, it's, I just, yeah, I don't know. Like in New Orleans, I would go to, there was this one store in the quarters 
where I would just go and look through the window and I was just like, oh, it's so perfect. <laughs> so for whatever reason, since I was like a kid, I wanted a store of some kind and a space that like could be a hub for a community, right? Mm -hmm. And when I started keeping reptiles, like even be before I even got my first panther chameleon, I was like, well, clearly I'm going to want to breed chameleons. So I need to, like the first enclosure that I built, I built it as a duplex because <laughs> I knew I was going to get another one. So <laughs> I just, yeah, it's so out the gate, I was like, I'm going to want to do this. But what I found like over the years is, yeah, like you come in, you think you're really interested in one thing for whatever reasons, but then over time you figure it out. Like, oh, this is like, I went from chameleons to Euromastix being my number one passion species, right? So they, they could not be more different. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And so the business itself started... I was just making products for myself, like for my reptiles. I'm like, oh, like I wish I had a feeding bowl that did this, or I wish like I had this. And I all I'm neurodivergent, as I think most of the folks that become hardcore hepatoculturalists are. I can I did some like really anecdotal research on this uh -huh. <laughs> like last week <laughs> that I could talk about. But uh and so I I have the shop, but I also I'm a teacher full time. Uh I teach graphic design over at Santa Rosa Junior College. And so I was supposed to be grading student work and my neurodivergent brain was like you know, it would be more fun if you teach yourself how to 3D model. And I was like, that would be more fun brain. Let's do that instead. So for eight <laughs> hours, I taught myself how to use Fusion 360. And then naturally, I'm like, well, I have to get a 3D printer because what am I going to do with this new knowledge? <laughs> so I bought a 3D printer and then I started making 3D printed products for reptiles. And But I was just making it for my own reptiles, like wanting, like wanting them to have stuff. And then I was like, oh, well, maybe other people would be interested in this. So I talked to my partner, Steph, and was like, hey, would you want to vend a, would you be down to vend a reptile show with me? And she's like, yeah, I'm down. Let's, let's do that. So then I signed up for Pomona. <laughs> As Just first starting small. <laughs> yeah. My first reptile show that we vended, we signed it, we signed up for Janu for a January Pomona. Oh and God. like and stuff's like and stuff was like, oh actually I didn't ask her in the beginning. I was like, yeah, yeah, I got this. And stuff's like, who you're gonna go by yourself? I was like, yeah, 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 I got this. No big deal. It's I can handle it. And she was like, No, I'm gonna come with you. I think <laughs> I think you need, I think you need more support than you think you do. And I'm so grateful she came with me because I literally, I think I literally would have died if I tried to do that by myself. We were so busy. It was insane. And I was like, yeah, I told her multiple times, like, I am so grateful that you didn't let me do this by myself. Like, I literally think I would have died if I tried to do this alone. Um, and so the, everything was a bit hit, like all my feeder bowls, like, like we did really well in sales and I was like, okay, this is cool. So then we like kept doing shows. Like we did, we did almost all the super shows that year. And then we did some like smaller local shows too, like the, the Pleasanton reptile show. And then we did the Vallejo show. And like, so like the idea was just like, like all things, the way that my brain works, like one day my brain was like, we should open a reptile store. And I was like, huh, sounds like a good idea, brain. And, but then I, I get my neurodivergence, I get fixated. So I got mm -hmm. fixated on the idea of opening a reptile store. And with most things, like if an idea pops in my head, I either have to do it or I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep thinking about it in a way that feels a little like, like torment <laughs> uh -huh. so so I was like I want to do this and I was talking to Steph about it and she's like oh you know I think it's a good idea and I was like I think it'll like it'll really help in a lot of different ways like 
I want to do this business more seriously. Like at that point I was, I had already had like successful pairings with my Euromastics, with my uh, Arnadas and my Yemenensis. Um, and then I had some like successful pairings with my bearded dragons, but bearded dragons are pretty easy. So I wasn't, I was like, okay, yeah. Um, and I was like, yeah, I think on a lot of, I can, I can see a really clear plan for how this could be a good idea, you know? And so then one day I was like, I'm just going to look at spaces. Like, no big deal. Like, I'm just, it, there's a space. I think it's cute. I'm just going to look at it. And then by that next week, the landlord had like sent me the lease. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I'll just gonna fill out the application and see what happens. And I got approved and he sent the lease. But like, I was, I was growing like increasingly uncomfortable with that guy. Like he was just like, I think he was, a, I think he was like, I'm not, I'm no psychologist or anything, but I was like, this behavior is feeling pretty narcissistic. Like I would ask mm. like a simple question, like what's that, what's the actual square footage? And he would do the equivalent of yelling via email. And I'm like, bro, you need to chill out. Like one, stop talking to me like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it's not cool, you know? And then he would try to like, try to like do like scarcity tactics. Like he would be like, well, there's other people that want the space. So, and so I, I wrote back to him. I was like, if other people want the space, let them have it, dude. You're not going to mm -hmm. pressure me into signing a lease. And then he would calm down. And he said, and like, try to gaslight me. He was like, oh, I'm not trying to pressure you. And I was like, nah, this dude's weird. I'm not written, I'm not written from him. Some subs up with that mm -hmm. guy. Um, and then I found this space and it's like double the size, more than double the size of the other space. I thought it was too big. I'm like, this is not, this is way bigger than I think I need. And Yeah. So it all started with 3D printed reptile products and kind of escalated from there. <laughs> That's like, so wild. Quickly escalated. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so. that was all like in the, like, what was the timeline on that? That was like a period of like two years. A, like a period of a year, I would say. We yeah. started, so our first, the first reptile show we vended was Pomona 20. This is 2024. So Pomona 2023 was the first reptile show we vended. So we just had our anniversary vending uh, this past Pomona in January. Nice. And so over, it just escalated over the course of the year. And I like, I kind of, I go all in with things. So in my yeah. past life, um, I, I founded a nonprofit called the Brown Ascenders and it was, what we the work we did was like advocacy work for brown black and indigenous folks within outdoor spaces and we would create opportunities for by for bipoc folks to engage in outdoor spaces in a way that felt accessible and and by accessible i mean like uh, financially accessible mentally mm -hmm. and emotionally accessible like all of that and so we did really good work with that nonprofit for a while and then COVID hit and like I was rock climbing before COVID, I was rock climbing like, like four times a week for like three, four hours. <laughs> it, uh -huh. it was a lot of climbing. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that, and then COVID hit and it kind of took climbing away. Like I wasn't, we, the gyms were closed and then, um, I didn't feel comfortable like climbing outside because I'm like, what if we get hurt and the hospital system is already really stressed? Like, I don't like, I don't think that's an like ethical thing to do. So we weren't climbing outside. We weren't climbing inside. And by the end of COVID, I was like, um, I, I think I'm done with this, mm -hmm. with this work, you know, and like doing any kind of racial justice work is really taxing, like mm -hmm. emotionally, mentally, it's really taxing. And so I was like, by this point, a lot of groups like ours, like little community groups were popping up to like create spaces for brown and black folks and indigenous folks within climbing. And mm -hmm. so I kind of felt like we planted the seed as an organization 
and other folks were like doing their thing. And I'm like, I, I was like, I don't think they, I don't think we're needed anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I want, like, this is community work and I want it to be community led. And so when I walked away from that, my, the whole, like the seven years I was doing that work, my board and for the, like, I was doing that work for seven years and we were official nonprofit for like, like four of those years. And my board the whole time was like, Summer, propose a salary. You need to propose a salary. And I was like, I will, I will. Yeah, yeah, I got you. I will, I'll do that. So I kept, they kept, like, Summer, when you need to propose a salary so that we can discuss it and approve it and start paying you. And I'm like, yeah, 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 for sure. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I never did it. And so then I went to them and I was like, guys, I want to dissolve the nonprofit. And this is my plan for our funds. I was like, I proposed a severance for myself. And then my proposal for the rest of the funds was that we distribute it to the smaller community groups uh, mm -hmm. so that they can have money to grow what they're doing. Yeah, and my board was like, so you're not going to take less than, and then I said, uh, they basically more than doubled <laughs> the amount that I said that I asked for. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, I had the seed money to start this space. So, Amazing. Yeah. That yeah. is so awesome. Yeah. So like, <laughs> let's talk about the space. Like, I, obviously okay. I've been there, but like, mm -hmm. let's just pretend that I haven't. <laughs> and we're going to do the virtual tour. You okay, know, okay. Like, tell us, tell us about like wh how you set it up. And like, yeah. also like, just g tell us about like the, like the monumental undertaking and effort it was that you did, you set it up the way you did. Yeah. Like, I, I, I still am just like, pretty blown away by what you what you created Dude, there and in the time i'm blown away did. i walk yeah, around the space and i'm like how the heck did you do this like when yeah, did awesome. you do this yeah it's i so my brain like i think everything is easy like i'm like oh i can do that <laughs> whatever that's e i can do that's that that's pretty easy, nice right? actually that's a nice so, attribute to have <laughs> So I go into most things with this like confidence of like, especially if it's like something I have to physically do, like if I'm building something or whatever. So I go and I'm like, ah, it's easy. I can do that. I'm not worried. I can do it. And so I, I came into this naturally like, oh, this is easy. I can do it. And about like three months into building like 40 custom enclosures and building all of the stands that are in here, like building literally everything in here I built from scratch. I was like, I'm exhausted. I am so tired. <laughs> this work is so difficult. But because my background is in design, I'm really aesthetically oriented. Uh, and then my background's also in like branding and brand strategy. There were certain things that I wanted from just from a visual standpoint, when folks walked in, like it was really important to me that it had a really cohesive aesthetic. So that meant all of the enclosures needed to be custom and to buy all the enclosures t for this space would have been like, like 30 to $50,000 for the, like you walk in and the first thing you see is a six foot by three foot by three foot enclosure with a full plexi front. <laughs> so uh -huh. like just that one alone, you know? And so I was like, the only way I can afford to do that is if I built everything myself. So I did some research and I, I figured out that buying a CNC machine, <laughs> buying all the PVC, teaching myself how to use the CNC machine, designing the enclosures, that would be, more financially accessible for me than like getting them all custom made by someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, so that was the, I was like, okay, that I, that logistical piece is in place. And like, I visit, I like every time me and Steph go anywhere, one of the first things we do is like, okay, let's find the reptile stores. <laughs> like, let's go visit them. And like, as I told you, like in like our private conversations, like, I'm just all, I've always, almost every store I go in, I'm like wildly disappointed by mm -hmm. what I see, you know? And mm -hmm. so for me, I wanted to offer something different to the conversation in terms of what a reptile store could be. 
And like, so I'd visit stores, I would take notes, like, this is what I don't like, this is what I like, like, and just like doing market research, um, like feet on the ground market research. And I like, I'm obsessed with how it smells in here. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like, I'm obsessed with that. And like, every morning when I walk in, I like, take a deep breath. And I'm like, Oh, something someone didn't eat their mouse where and like, that's like something <laughs> like I'm, I'm obsessed with that. And like, I also wanted to have full size enclosures and, and I knew that was going to limit the amount of animals I could have in the space, but that wasn't a priority for me to like pack the space with as many animals as I could. Like the whole space is about 1300, a little over 1300 square feet. So I could fit a lot of animals and enclosures in here, but Mm -hmm. it was important to me that the enclosures are full size and, and like, it was important to me that I have display enclosures with animals that live in the store. Like some of my personal animals that live here full time so that folks could see, like, I have like my, like Joel Lacerda hatchlings here or babies or they're they're juveniles at this point, Mm -hmm. but my Joel Lacerda juveniles here. But then I also have uh, one of my breeding pairs, uh, Samson and Delilah here. So folks can see like this tiny little cute reptile is going to become him (laughs) at some point or her at some point. And this is an example of what a good setup like them looks like. I wanted people to be able to experience that and have a clear Mm -hmm. understanding of like, this is what I'm getting myself into. Um, Like literally, (laughs) like literally be able to see that translation. Um, So yeah, you walk in and one, it doesn't smell bad. <laughs> it's, it smells pretty good. <laughs> and you're greeted by the, the six foot uh, three, the six three by three with plexi front right in the front of the store. And it's the first thing that you see. And inside of there, I have a, a small colony of giant butterfly agamas that are like my personal animals. Um, and then you look around and I wanted the store to feel like when you first walk in, I wanted it to feel like small and cozy. Mm -hmm. And when you, after you walk down the aisles that are on the side of the butterfly agama enclosure, then it opens up and you see the rest of the space. So oftentimes folks walk in and then they're like, they walk past me at my checkout counter and they're like, holy (laughs) crap, this place is so much bigger than I thought it was. And I'm like, (laughs) that's what I was going for, you know? And uh, like when you first walk in, there's a couch and a rug. I think I'm going to add like another seat there. And mm-hmm. I'm, I have plans to build like a coffee table, uh, vampire crab enclosure, uh, nice. mainly for the kids. It's going to be like my breeding group yeah, of vampire sure. crabs, but mainly for the kids, they like to sit on the floor. So I just can see kids sitting there, like staring at the crabs doing their thing. Um, but I want it to be the type of space that folks hang out and for a while and it's working i think on average most folks stay in the store like an hour to two hours when they come in and they hang out um yeah does that answer the question i think i i tried no it's great oh it's (laughs) fantastic yeah Yeah. no you did great yeah i mean you've also though you've got like the whole like cnc zone in the shop yeah. where you yeah. uh, you're taking custom orders right for like yeah, yeah. Yeah. for builds for, for for customers and then also yeah. right now you're seated in like like a community space right that's like yeah. the, the idea is kind of be like people can hang out here and have like herb yeah. club meetings or like yeah, lectures exactly. that kind of thing yeah. So, so like, the, I don't know. I, I just think, yeah, it's, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You yeah. The area <laughs> that I'm sitting in right now is the back portion of the store. And I intentionally left this area clear because uh, there's like a projection screen on that side of me, but it's, we're, we're going to have like movie nights, uh, do classes and workshops. I want like herp clubs to host meetings here. Um I off I, I offered the invitation out to uh, Northern California Herpetological Society and yeah like I I want this space to be a hub for community like I'll come back here sometimes and there's these big giant uh, super comfortable like 
pillow chair things. They're not quite beanbag chairs, but uh-huh. but I'll come back here and there'll be like a kid napping. <laughs> oh, <laughs> on the pillows. Yeah. So it's like super cute, you know. And That's awesome. so I I want folks to I want folks to feel like comfortable and at home in the space. Yes, what was Thursday? Thursday, this little boy, his mom, there's a, a washeteria uh in the in the same building. And his mom was washing clothes and he just came over and hung out for like two hours. <laughs> and yeah, it was it was pretty sweet. He's just like walking around with me, asking me questions and like uh, I did a custom enclosure build for a red a red eared slider that would allow the turtle to be able to like get out of the tank and have like a safe space to roam. And so my customers came to pick up their order and he was just like hanging out with us, listening to me explain to them like this is how the sump pump works. And <laughs> so I love that though. Like that's why I made the space for for moments like that to happen, you know. So for sure that's like that's awesome i mean yeah I been that kid for sure you know like <laughs> oh my god i would have been a terror probably <laughs> it's really but there's a few that's... kids who come in and they're so like they're just so stoked there's this like mom and her son they came in they came in on uh they came in this week i think yesterday yeah they came in yesterday and he's in kindergarten and i am so impressed by this kid like he's heavy into the research like she's like oh yeah he's like he finds a new animal that he's a new reptile he's interested in and he just like like binge watches every youtube video he can find about that animal and like right now he's begging his mom to get him a garter snake (laughs) he comes in and he's like I want a garter snake. And she was like, you, you, you need to talk to your dad about that. <laughs> it's very, but he's so, he's so cute and they have a bearded dragon. So they come in and get supplies for the bearded dragon, but he's, yeah, he's like, I want a garter snake. <laughs> so, and he's in kindergarten. He's very cute. And he's so, I'm like, you're my type of kid, man. Like yeah, you geek totally. out over the information. You love the animals, but yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, I love that. It's it's really cool to have like the community aspect of it, and yeah, yeah, and just like also to be like doing it your own way, you know. I like, mm-hmm. like, yeah. yeah. I feel curious about like, like. I mean, like, obviously, it's like already like implied, you know, and like a lot of what we mm-hmm. talked about, but like more explicitly, like, like what's the model, like that that you're that you're presenting with the shop that is like different you know from like the mainstream yeah. reptile shop model like like yeah. just to put it out there like how do you want it to be different you know how do you want it to be better <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so we so as a store i'm like animal welfare first and animal welfare first and education first so like for example one of my customers that bought a jewel asserted she was getting ready for that jewel asserted for like a month, month and a half before she, before she could buy him and bring him home. And it's intentional. It's like, you have to have the enclosure set up ahead of time. You have to have the correct lighting. You have to understand supplementation. You have to understand like the like lighting schedules, like what the light does for them. And these are all conversations that I have with folks like helping them get prepared. And like most folks that get an animal that purchased animals from us, like they'll come in, they get the information they need to get started. I get them set up and like it evolves over time. And then they come in and get the animal once all of that happens. Like no one can walk in off the street and say, I want this bearded dragon right now and like leave out the door with it. It's just not, it's not how our system works. And like in terms of sales, like intentionally, um, I think about it as like multiple streams of income within the mm-hmm. store space and animals are the bottom tier and that's intentional for the animals mm-hmm. to be the bottom tier. And a part of that is like being able to, I just like the goal is to never depend on animal sales in any big way. So it's like being able to turn people away and say no. And like, as of now, like our biggest source of income is like dry goods. 
So mm-hmm. it's like the care supplies, lighting, light fix, like all of that stuff is our biggest, that's our biggest sellers, uh, as yeah. well as enclosures. And then after that, it's feeders um, and like animals or like, like classes and stuff. And then like animals are like the, like, like bottom ish tier of yeah. like our, our like income streams, you know? And, and that's really intentional. And like, it's every, tr- every like interaction with customers, like I want to break that idea of like this being transactional because mm-hmm. these are living creatures and it feels really filthy to be like, Cause I mean, we are on some levels, like this is a sales transaction. You're going to give me money. I'm going to give you an animal. Um, but I want it to be like the way that I'm approaching it. It's more of like a relationship building between me and the person that is purchasing the animal. Um, so that it's less like, okay, I gave you some money. Give me this animal. I'm out of here. I'll do what I want, Mm -hmm. you know? And what I'm finding in doing that, even with customers who didn't get their animals from us, like we end up with this really lovely relationship where they feel safe coming in and being like, oh, I messed up. I did X, Y, and Z. Like I had a customer call me earlier in the week and this was my first interaction with him, but he's had a leopard gecko for uh, 16 years since he was a kid. And it's, from what he was saying to me, I think he's developing uh, issues with MBD. Um, Mm -hmm. And, but like, we had this long conversation about like, you know, this is what you can do. Like, it's not reversible, but you can stop the process. You need to go to a vet. Mm -hmm. I recommended different vets for him to go to, you know? And like, I want it to be that way because oftentimes like, if, like if he would have went to say like some of the Facebook groups, they'd have been like, Oh, like, what do you mean you haven't been giving them supplements like that? You know, they really would have bashed them. But the person I had a conversation with this 22 year old young man, he's like, I love this reptile. Like I wasn't allowed to have, he's like, he wasn't allowed to have fur animals growing up because his mom is allergic. So she's, but she's like, you can have a reptile. And she's like, so I got my leopard gecko. And he says, and he says, I want to do everything I can. He just didn't, he's not a herpeticulturalist, you know, he's a, right. He's a, he has a pet reptile, so he isn't plugged in to all of these streams of information. And he's like, I just, I didn't know, like, I didn't even know I needed to know this, you know, like, so it's, I I want it to be a safe space for stuff like that, where folks can come and ask questions and feel like, feel okay with that and actually get, know they're going to get good information that they can trust. And like, yeah, so that's some of the things. And then also like just the way that the store is set up and the whole vibe, like it's, it's, you walk in and the store, like it feels really clean. Like all the enclosures are full size. Um, all of them are bioactive and planted. Um, and I'm heavy on like bioactive and because like I said, I've never kept them in any other way. (laughs) It's like what I'm most knowledgeable about, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. but I'm really intentional in that there's some enclosures that are crazy that look really hard to do. And then there's some that are really simple because I don't want anyone to be intimidated. Like, oh my God, if everything, if every enclosure looks crazy and they're like, I can never do that. You know, like I wanted to also be approachable. Um, and so little stuff like that, just like thinking about the overall experience of folks and thinking about like, how will someone feel if this is all they see when they come in and like, Mm -hmm. you know, I want to make sure that the hobby itself comes across really accessible. My goal is to cultivate her pediculturalist as Mm -hmm. opposed to just like a reptile keeper, you know, or like a person Mm -hmm. who has a reptile. Like that's my goal to like help folks really, even if it's just like one reptile, like help them dive into the whole sphere of reptile keeping for them Mm -hmm. and their one reptile, you know? So (laughs) that's that's a cool distinction. I really (laughs) like that. I really like that, that distinction about like, yeah, trying to cultivate herpetoculture rather than just like, Keepers. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it makes me like curious too, just like like zooming out more broadly, like like are there like specific trends that you're seeing in herpetoculture um or like changes that you're seeing in herpetoculture since you've been a part of it that like have you yeah. excited or like optimistic or like mm -hmm. and like also like on the other side of that, like what are the things like that you wish would change, you know, yeah. or like yeah, if yeah. you if you're willing to speak on all that. I know I can yeah. be my a little controversy, but... yeah, <laughs> for yeah. sure. So, like, <laughs> so one of the things that I'm seeing, like, it's like the same things that like a lot of other folks talked about on the show. Like, there is a movement of folks that want to focus on animal welfare, right? And I know even saying that term, animal welfare, can in and of itself be like a filthy word in our community, mm -hmm. which is like mm -hmm. crazy to me because it's not like what are we focused on if we're not focused on the welfare of our animals you know like what are we, what are, like what are we even doing and it's like mm. but yeah that's a whole nother topic but yeah like i see this movement of folks that and like i'm i'm one of those folks like i'm coming in on that wave of of like new like new keepers that are really focused on like the health and well-being of the animals and like really like focused on the education um and that in and of itself made me feel like it could be possible that a store like mine could exist and like do well and like i've heard phil say and like i've heard other folks say that like oh stores made like like they don't they can't make it you know mm -hmm. and so it's like i and I understand, like, I can totally understand that point of view. And especially based on, like, some of the history of what reptile keeping has looked like so far, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think we're getting to a place where folks are just, like, mindful, uh, really mindful about the way that they keep their animals. Like, like my partner really, like, my partner got into snakes. <laughs> so, like, I was all about the lizards. And then I was like, oh, I have to, I'm going to open a store. Like, I need to, I need to, like, be more well-rounded. And then I really fell hard in love with garter snakes. And I had all my garter snakes at home, but then I moved them to the store. And so she's like, oh, the snakes are gone so now she has her own 13 snakes <laughs> mm -hmm. um but like one of the folks that she like she likes to learn from is like Lori Torini and mm -hmm. she practices a uh, choice-based handling and like I love that you know like it's just about what is the like let the animal choose do they want to come out do they want to be interacted with you know and I feel like there's just this whole like generation of keepers that are really mindful of that. Like the, the fact that these animals have wants and needs mm -hmm. <laughs> and like all of that stuff, you know? So, yeah. And stuff that like, I mean, just my, like my philosophy or my way of keeping, like I'm aesthetically oriented, science oriented, and like, I want to create these like beautiful spaces. So like there are certain styles of keeping that are definitely like the antithesis of that, you know, mm -hmm. but not calling out any one specific, any like any one style specifically. Honestly, I think the thing that I would want to see go the most is like, pe like people who have like dug their heels in the mud, you know, mm -hmm. that are just like, this is it like that like and we'll argue we'll argue to the like cows come home that like this is the only best way to do this thing you know yeah. and i i think in general like just in life in general like very few things are black and white like everything's a spectrum you know mm -hmm. and like even with like naturalistic keeping or like bioactive keeping it could be great and it could be horrible, you know, like depending yeah. on your understanding of how to like correctly create the science of those environments, you know? And so like everything's a spectrum and I just wish folks, I wish like as a whole folks would tap into that more. Like actually everything's a spectrum and there's no one way that's like, this is the absolute way to do it. And like, and like, just be more open to like being flexible and learning and evolving and changing and all of that stuff. Cause like, we're a, like a, 
we're we're like a young hobby especially compared to like fish keeping or something you know yeah. and i really admire fish keeping like i started with fish before i came over to reptiles and like aquascaping is like was just like is so passionate about aquascaping you know mm-hmm. and like what i see there is so much willingness to like evolve and grow and learn and like we're like as a hobby, pretty much still in our, like, I don't know, adolescent phase. Mm -hmm, (laughs) Um, mm -hmm. And there's so much we still just don't know. Like I just, for me with my keeping, I have at least four different species that there's like hardly any information at all about their care and like how to set them up, you know? So, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that's really well said. I mean, it seems, it seems like, yeah cultivating a mindset of like perpetual curiosity and like yes. you know and and like also just a a willingness to progress and mm-hmm. see things differently i think is so important yeah. like and not obviously not just in herbiculture but just like in life it's mm-hmm. it's it's a good thing to be flexible you know and yeah. and um it creates a lot more resilience i think and a lot more possibility for for positive change to happen. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, it makes me so curious, like thinking about like, like, I think about this a lot, like what is herpetoculture going to look like in 10 years, you know, yeah. like, because mm-hmm. it does feel like they're changing. Um, yeah. And and sometimes changing fast. And in other ways, you know, like you said, there's, you've got plenty of folks who want to dig in their heels and, and not and resist that with all they got. And I think that that's true in most places um you know like like regardless of whether it's herpetoculture or some other discipline or hobby or whatever you want to call it but um yeah i'm curious like do you have any thoughts about that like where like what's it gonna look like i mean is it (laughs) does it just feel like totally like mysterious to you and opaque or what do you think yeah no i think that's a i think that's a good question uh for sure so i have Oh, did I wait? Did I lose the thought? I had one more thing I wanted to. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. So I wanted to add one more thing to the last question of things I would want to see change. And it's also like folks being honest about their motivations and not necessarily yeah. like on like I'm not saying it has to necessarily them being honest with the world, but at least honest with themselves, you know, uh, because there's just like different styles of keeping that have different motivating factors for why folks are doing that. You know, it's like you're keeping in that style because it's safe space and it's perfect for that need that you have, like economy Mm -hmm. of space and maximizing of potential like profits you could make with your animals, Mm -hmm. you know? And so like just being honest with ourselves about what our motivations are like I know a part of my motivation is I'm aesthetically oriented and like I want it to look pretty you know (laughs) and I have to be careful that sometimes I'm not leaning so far to the pretty that I'm forgetting about the usability for the animal you know like it could be a detriment so So that's another thing, like folks just being honest about their motivations, honest with themselves so that they can understand like, oh, like I'm making these choices for these reasons and then making peace with that. Like I'm okay with this being a part of the reasons why I'm making these choices, you know? So, yeah. And yeah, I really like that. That's, that's part of the reason why we ask the question we do at the end of every episode is because like, Mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of different motivations and reasons why people do this thing. And like, I want to, I want people to think about why they're doing it, even if they, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like, yeah, Yeah. (laughs) cause I'm thinking about why I'm doing it a lot. Like, and it's, I don't necessarily feel like everybody has to like, know, like I have a perfect answer, but I think it's a good thing. It's a good thought experiment. Yeah. You know. Yeah, we have those conversations, you and I, about like feeling bad about like, is this a, is this right? Is this wrong? What yeah. we're doing? <laughs> is it yeah, yeah so, totally. You know, yeah, yeah. It's I important. think that's a good I think that's a good thing, you know. Like I mean Phil and I have talked about that too, that like, you know, mm-hmm. you, it's okay to have like a to question that at times. And I think that it can yeah. be a good motivator for like 
pos- again, positive change and, and progression and, and prioritizing the right things, which is ultimately yeah, exactly. like at the end of the day, it's like prioritizing the animals is, is, yeah, is exactly. yeah. the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, Maybe controversial to say, but but it's not, and it's not always, it's definitely not always the case, you know, and like yeah. one of the things uh, oh, I promise I'll get back to your other question. One no, of the things okay. that I think could help, like in terms of folks understanding, like what's the motivations behind their the decisions they make with keeping, is that it makes having conversations easier. You know, like if say someone who keeps in racks is getting in an argument with someone who keeps in vivs, like. Mm-hmm if they're approaching it from the standpoint of like, well, this is my, this is why I keep it right. So this is my motivation, you know, then like the Viv keeper, they understand like, Oh, my motivations are very different from that. We're like, we have, we're coming from two totally different places. We're not going to meet up unless like my, my reasons completely change or their reasons completely change. Like we're not going to meet in some middle place. Like, we right, have very different totally. reasons for our decision making. And I see the arguments that happen oftentimes around a lot of these topics. And I'm just like, well, like what they're doing makes sense to them based on why they make their decisions. Like it's not right. going to make sense to you because you have totally different reasonings for the decisions that you make, you know? So, but yeah. Yeah. I think <laughs> that's, that's a good thing for people to be considering, you know, before, yeah. before like totally. <laughs> destroying each other it's <laughs> like popping off on each other like yeah mad. Exactly. It's like, what? It's like, why are you bringing the smoke bro like we don't even <laughs> we don't even like the same things for the same reasons like i'm yeah, not totally. we're not in the same lane like leave me alone <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, yeah totally totally uh, yeah that's fair and in, t- in terms of what her pedicultor looks like is this like my i like my ideal of what it looks like it could be that like yeah, yeah. your ideal would be great or, okay. or just like what do you think is gonna happen you know like yeah. what's it gonna look like i'm always just just thinking about yeah. that so i think like i think as new keepers keep coming in like folks that have um, whatever like different mindsets around keeping and like prioritizing animal welfare and folks that are also really conscious about voting with their dollar, like the different types of companies that they support and like who they're buying from. Um, I think over time that will like, there's a lot of awesome breeders doing it in really cool ways and I think for the breeders that have that aren't quite doing it in the ways that they should, as folks are, or as well as they could be, like folks voting with their dollar will like maybe force them to change. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that'll be a part of it. Like I think there's a lot of room for a positive movement in that way, especially as like like these folks with like new mindsets uh, keep flowing in. Mm-hmm. And I I think there's going to be like, I see a lot, a lot more people talking about how, like, I wish I would have got less animals. I wish I would have got less animals. So, and like the, the portion of us that like start breeding is really like a smaller, a much a small percentage <laughs> Uh, Mm -hmm. in terms of the whole scheme of things, you know, but I think that there's going to be more emphasis on like giving fewer animals really good lives, um, Mm -hmm. which I think, which I think is rad. Um, Yeah. And then ideally I would love to see like one of the pet projects I have going in the store right now is I have some uh, Florida non-native Walcotts in here. And so I have some toke geckos, but then I also have some uh, dusky amoebas, which are, those things are so cool. I am so passionate they so about cool. them. They're very cool. Yeah. And so I've gotten eggs from them multiple times, but I wasn't ready. So I haven't mm-hmm. incubated any of the eggs. I tried, I tried incubating once, but um, the egg, it was like just one egg and it ended up molding. Mm-hmm. So Mm -hmm. like, I want to work with those guys. I want to do like, I want to produce some captive bread, but then I also want to get folks excited about 
the non-native species in Florida. Oh, and I also have the Hispaniola and curly tails and I'm like, oh, right. please yeah, give me eggs, say. please. I love those guys. So like, I want to get folks excited about some of the cool species in Florida that are in, that are like non-native and like create like a little bit of a pipeline of getting those mm-hmm. wild caughts like into the hands of folks that can handle them. Like, of course, acclimating them first myself and making sure that they're good and ready to go to a home um, and just get like a really good program going with that. And then hopefully others like other stores will see and be like, oh, like, OK, summer, that's summer has that working. It looks like it's working. And then like other reptile stores will do the same thing. <laughs> so we can have this whole like Florida non-native like pipeline, <laughs> getting some of those animals out of the wild. Um, Mm -hmm. and as a hobby, we can be very good at like decimating wild populations. (laughs) So maybe, (laughs) maybe we could put some of that effort, uh, to get used with like decimating those non-native Florida, uh, species and getting them out of those environments. Yeah. And and to everyone listening, I was partially joking on that, (laughs) (laughs) the us being good at decimating. I know there's a lot of factors that go into population decline, habitat loss, and all of that stuff. So I was, I was partially joking. Nice <laughs> qualification there. Yeah, I just, don't, I was like, oh, I should. Don't get yeah. at Summer about that. <laughs> yeah, don't come, don't come, don't come adding me, bro. <laughs> um, or don't come adding me, and then we can have a conversation. <laughs> yeah, there you so, go. But, yeah. So yeah, so stuff like that, like I that would be really cool to see that happening on a larger scale. Cause like, I'm sure there's other stores doing it, like not quite talking about it that much. And like, I know like as individual stores, we can't do very much, but if we're like a network of stores doing it, it's like one income for the folks that are catching the wild caughts in Florida and the like non-native species. And then also like, yeah, just, good for all of us too. Like there's the income of selling them and then like the income around or then like education around like this was going on in Florida. This is a really cool species with very little information about them. So there's very little information around the dusky amoebas. So Mm -hmm. I've just been like on iNaturalist locating them in Panama and Venezuela and like looking at weather data and looking at photos <laughs> of like sightings, like trying to figure it all out. Uh, shout out to you for that tip. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. So. Yeah. That's a fun way to do it. It's like virtual yeah. herping, you know, it's not quite, yeah. it's not quite the same, but it's, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. I yeah, that's one of my like I my I don't want to go to sleep yet activities. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Me too. Me yeah. too for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Well, what about like your your personal kind of goals for? I mean, it could be for the shop. It could be for like mm-hmm. yourself as a keeper, or maybe we do both yeah. of those. Like, yeah, what are like summers keeper goals, and like what yeah. are your goals for like where you want to see the shop headed? Yeah. So like a lot of folks that get into reptiles, I made the mistake, the big mistake we most of us make of getting too many animals like too fast. Like I made that mistake. And like I wasn't even really like I was just excited about everything. And I wasn't completely sure like what are the ones I'm most passionate about. And so now that I know that, like I'm really passionate about your mastics. Uh, Joe Lacerda's, the Amoebas, and like mostly Maine, big passionate about the Euromastics and like some of the rare species, like the Yemenenses and like Flavi Fasciatas, like the Orange Bandits. Um, like my goal is, and like it's so painful to say because I love them, but I think that it would, it really would be what's best for them and for me, like time wise. Uh, to like get out of most of my bearded dragons. Mm -hmm. Um, And I love my bearded dragons, but it's like, I'm not, I realize I'm not as passionate about them as I am about like my Euromastics, you know? And so like I, with the bearded dragons, like I want to only, only do high content hybrids, uh, Pagona, Barbata and Vetiseps hybrids. Mm -hmm. And so like, 
and just like small batch breeding. So I have a pair of Pagona verbatas, and then I imported three uh, Pagona verbatas, but they were like, dude, I kid you not, like under, they were maybe like six, like six grams or so. Like Whoa, they were really, so they were like, small. they were so small. Like they were like, they were very small and like, like maybe like, like maybe like eight grams, nine grams at most. And so it was really a struggle mm-hmm. to keep them alive. And cause they shipped, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I think they came from Germany potentially. Mm-hmm. And cause that's like the only place where I know someone is like captive breeding them. And yeah. so I got them in, I got in the three and only two of them made only one of them ended up making it and i was mm-hmm. lucky because the one that made it it was like a one two and the one that mm-hmm. made it was a, one of the girls because i already mm-hmm. have a boy so that would have been yeah. a bummer if, yeah, <laughs> if the boy totally. was the one yeah i was like yeah geez so like with bearded dragons i just want to hone in on doing like 50 percent to 100 percent pagona bravada hybrids and those mainly aimed at breeders to like help mm-hmm. them like strengthen up their genetic lines with their breeder dragons. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. And then like my, like my chameleons, like I was really passionate with them from the start, you know, and I thought about selling them, but I, I, I just don't like, I have two of my chameleons, two of my males in the store. And every time folks ask me how much they are, I was, cause I don't have a price. I don't, I didn't put a yeah. price on them. And I'm just like, oh, they're not for sale. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, but I I just really want to hone in on like the specific species that I'm really like curious about. And like the giant butterfly agamas, the Hispaniola and curly tails and the dusky amoebas, there's not a lot of information about their care. Mm-hmm. And so that in and of itself is a huge undertaking to just try to wrap my mind around like how to set them up properly. And the amoebas, it's even just figuring out like, what should I be feeding you? <laughs> like, I know insects, but like also because they're like in the same family as tegus, like Taide, however you say yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Today, I'm like, should I also be feeding you like meat? Like, so like, I tr- I tried them out like with some ground turkey with egg and other stuff mixed in, but they ate a little bit of the ground turkey, but they mainly just licked all the egg off of yeah <laughs> of everything. So I was like, all right, you guys like eggs? I already knew that about them, you know. Mm-hmm. So like that in and in and of itself is a pretty big undertaking, like wrapping my mind around like the proper care for these animals where there's very little information about mm-hmm. them at all. Like the Hispaniola and curly tails, like I was under the, imp- like everything I was finding kept talking about dry and arid. And then I had a conversation with someone this week on Instagram who has successfully bred them in the past. And he is like, mm-hmm. he was like, so basically they need to be set up similar to the giant butterfly agama. It's like neotropical. Mm-hmm. It needs to be really hot, humid, but not really wet. So I'm like, yeah. great. I got yeah. myself into that again. Cause yeah. these giant butterfly goblins. See, like, I love set of parameters. It is. I love the giant butterfly agamas, but trying to make something super humid, but like dry, like not wet yeah. has been like such a, a brain twister for me, you know? So that's my goals for myself. I want to simplify hone in on the the species that I know just like really make my heart sing and like with my main breeding being focused on the Euromastics and my main keeping being focused on the Euromastics I'm trying to grow my Yemenensis colony like all the time or my group of Yemenensis of uh, uh, Phil shout out to him right now he sold me a um a two one uh, nice. adult group of Yemenenses and then Harash uh, he he's so awesome he sold me my adult uh, Arnadas as well as some adult 
preeminences as well. Cool. And so I've been meeting just like the right people and having them be like, all right, you're dope. I'll, yeah, let's do this. Like, uh, mm-hmm. like Harash reached out to me and he was like, I was going to list these, but I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to offer them to you first and you better take them because you're <laughs> like, you're not going to see this anywhere else. So you better uh-huh. take them. And then he also sold them to me at it. He, he like sold me to him at like a killer price. Like he gave me nice. a deal on him. So That's I was great. like, all right, I, yes, let's do that. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's it. I want to hone in and like the store, one of my big goals is within a, like, I'm hoping this year goes really well, like continues to go mm-hmm. well. And I want to rent this space next door to me and nice. uh, move all my animals from home. Well, not all of them, but like most of like my breeding groups, move them from home to next door because I'm here all the time. And the animals here get so much of my attention, but my animals at home, like morning and like right now my animals are paired off and I'm pretty much nervous all day that they're getting along well because I'm not there, you know? So the first thing I do in the morning is I check, I'm like, all right, everyone's good. And then, and usually like once, like once they're together, like I haven't had, like they'll have their uh, initial standoff sometimes where they do their like circling of each other. Um, and a lot of times they immediately pair. Um, but like once they're in, they do pretty well from what I've noticed. Like I don't see a lot of fighting, which is good. Um, but I don't know that cause I'm not home, you know, like totally. yeah, I want to like, so I, I want to rent the space next door, move all my animals over there. And then also I could do like facility tours. So people could do like five bucks or 10 bucks or something and do like full facility tours. And I want to be really transparent around my breeding programs and all of that type of stuff. I think mm-hmm. like the hobby could use more transparency. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, because with transparency comes accountability. And I, I love that. So, yeah. So that's my goals. That's what, Yeah. <laughs> I want to do, and I want to quit my job. (laughs) Yeah, quit the day job, just have the shop. I want to quit the day job. Yeah, I love teaching. I really do. But I I love my students. My students are the best part of the work that I do. Um, Mm. But the environment itself is really toxic. And I'm like, life is, like, life is super long. It's like the longest thing we do. But it's also too short to spend, like, time in toxic environments when you don't, yeah. when you can give yourself other options, you know? So I want out sure. of the toxic environment for sure. So, yeah, maybe so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Cool. Well, um, I feel like that was kind of the main things I wanted to talk about with you today, but you yeah. did, you did drop a little lure about neurodiversity. Earlier. <laughs> oh, I did. <laughs> Oh man. So I'm kind so, of like I'm kind of curious to talk to you about that. <laughs> if you want to talk about it. Yeah, no, we Because totally I feel like could. this is a yeah, I feel like it's like I mean I've we've I've I've had uh you know I had Bill Stewart on the show a while back, you know, we talked about yeah. this a lot. But it's mm-hmm. something that like I've had a lot of conversations with folks in herpetoculture offline, you know, yeah. not on the podcast about this. So I'd I'd, I'd yeah. love to hear your thoughts about <laughs> that whole that whole uh, yeah. intersection. Well, I, I, so like dubia.com posted, uh, what did it say? It said like there's 6 million reptile keepers in the world. And then it was like 300,000 of them are like competiculturalists basically. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and like, I hear that number getting thrown around all the time, like 6 million, 6 million. And I'm like, Oh, I wonder if that's like actually the number. And I've been using chat GPT a lot lately as like a research tool and Mm. also as like a brainstorming sounding board. And it's been so awesome. Like so much so that like I decided to pay for it. And so I can have access to like the search results are like a deeper analysis of whatever the questions that I'm asking. So I asked yeah. Chad GPT, I was like, how many U S households have reptiles? And it said like 4.5 million households have U uh, S households have reptiles. And then they said like, 
nine, it's estimated that 9.4 million are in those households. Like there's like with each household having like two reptiles. And I was right, like, yeah. well, that's clearly not accurate because if I just look at my house, <laughs> and the like 50 reptiles plus yeah. like, like that number is probably baloney but like based on what like based on what uh like dubia posted i was just like oh like what's the percentage of that so like yeah. i and so the percentage like the percentage of like three hundred thousand of the 600 of the 6 million and it was something like four point something percent or something like that so then I searched like what percentage of the U.S. population has <laughs> is neurodivergent or has ADHD, and the percentage came back at like four point something, and I was like, oh, <laughs> curious. <laughs> so then I did like a more deep dive with a Chat GPT to see if I could get like more accurate numbers and mm -hmm. like asking the questions in certain ways, and so then based on what I got out of Chat GPT the percentage I ended up with where it's like that are likely hepatoculturalists was like, uh, like three point something percent, like high three point mm -hmm. something percent. And I'm just like, I think by like loose theory is that the folks that become hepatoculturalists all have like ADHD or are neurodivergent. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> like we mm -hmm. all dive deep like all this is all a huge hyper fixation for us or it's our special interest and we all just dive deep into it so that's like my anecdotal <laughs> research I love that, that I did <laughs> I think Thanks, that's really. I mean yeah I mean I I I, I, I yeah I'm with you on all that I feel like it's a uh, there's definitely a pattern there yeah um and, and, and i don't know it also yeah. makes me like it also just makes me so curious about like i don't know just like uh, like something we're, we're constantly talking about on the show is like mm -hmm. this kind of conflict between like our our like hardware and our software you know like like mm -hmm. our like our animal biology and like our modern lives and like yeah. modern civilization mm -hmm. you know and how these things can sometimes be at odds with one another yeah and i think about that too like just like with with like you know our framing around these terms like even like terms like neurodiversity and stuff like that yeah. it's like yeah well like com like like what's the standard you know that we're yeah, like exactly. basing these yeah. things off like it's like it's like it, you know if it's a relative term like mm -hmm. would our ancestors who are you know like yeah. would they have called themselves neurodiverse or would they have just been like yeah. no we're just we're just doing our thing, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, all this stuff I, I think is so interesting because, like, so much I'm, of it is, like, relative and it has to do with, yeah. like, framing of, of the culture itself, which, I don't know, I think it's it's, it's really true. So I, I, I was listening to this podcast, like, maybe last week or the week before, and they were talking about, uh, like, ADHD as, like, a, and, like, neurodivergency as, like, a superpower. And mm -hmm. so it was, like, it was this, and so they were talking like exactly like what you're saying right now, the idea of early ancestors and that, God, what was it? So saying that folks that could be like within individual communities, folks that were like easily distracted, like you hear sound, you hear like easily reacting to sounds mm -hmm. that like those members within the society were found to be like uh oh actually i think it was like a like a contemporary study i think it was like a contemporary study done with like groups of folks like maybe in africa and it was like folks who were more like aware of sounds around them they'd hear sound they hear that like those folks were uh better nourished and mm. like they were better nourished and like like overall like healthier within that society because it made them mm -hmm. like better hunters and better yeah. gatherers it's like oh i see i see a bear i see a color oh is that a bear or i see a i hear a sound like is that a is that a prey is that or that's mm -hmm. like yeah yeah i guess we're a predator and they're prey <laughs> so yeah, is that yeah. a like you know a food item you know and so but then like 
And then the folks that were like less distractible were like less nourished and mm-hmm. like not as healthy as the ones that were easily distracted. So I was like, yeah, heck yeah. Yes, that's awesome. <laughs> Being easily distracted is a superpower. I dig that's it. That's really interesting but, to me. But they said like within like within a more like um like modernized or like contemporary society folks that were like easily distractible were less nourished and Mm -hmm. like a more like, yeah, like a more like urban or like contemporary society or something like that. So I was like, what? That's crazy. That's crazy. (laughs) I was like, that also makes sense. You know, like, it totally makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, huh. So I, yeah, I don't know. It's definitely, I feel like I look at my, I look at my like neurodivergence as like definitely as a superpower, but it's also a hindrance for sure Mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways. Um, But from the front of a superpower, it makes it, it is the reason why I'm like, oh yeah, I can do that. That's easy, but I can figure it out. Like, (laughs) like, I just, I feel like, I feel like my brain has like, not to like toot my own horn too much, but mm-hmm. I feel like my brain is so good at taking in new information and then translating that into physical skill. And mm-hmm. like, all, like I had no idea how to use a CNC machine or like, like any of this stuff. And I've got the CNC machine and I made my first enclosure within a week. And I'm like, all right, let's just keep figuring it out as we go, you know? But, and so, and like, I feel like those skills are awesome and translatable, but also like, if I wouldn't have learned the, like taught myself the coping skills that I did growing up, like, I don't think my life would be like as cool as it is right now. You know, like, I don't think I would be living the life I would want to be living if my, if I wouldn't have learned how to cope with the way that my brain wants me to function you know so Mm -hmm. it's it's a double-edged sword there but yeah and i definitely have too many reptiles right now because i think of my neurodivergence and my lack of self-control slash impulse control Uh (laughs) so those those, like those two things combining is a a a thing yeah yeah it's such a thing i mean like i I've, I mean, I've shared about this a million times on the show, but like, I definitely, like, I have to, I have to put guardrails up for myself because I just, because I know myself well enough yeah. at this point, you know, that like, mm-hmm. all right, if I don't have like the limitation of like, okay, this is, this is the, the room that I have to work yeah. with. Yeah. This is like the minimum size of habitat mm-hmm. that I will accept for any yeah. animal, <laughs> yeah. you know, <laughs> how many Habitats can I appropriately fit in this space? Okay, that's that's yeah. it. That's it. That's all I've got. Yeah. You know, and mm-hmm. um, like it was yeah. it was helpful when I kind of came back to herpetoculture to be able to like reverse the process. Mm-hmm. You know, like I started with all of the setups, and then I started getting yeah. animals to fill. Like, okay, what's going to yeah. fit well into this and that and that. Yeah. And um, and that's a beautiful way to do it. You know, like that's totally. like that's a part of the mindset I I try to cultivate with like our customers in the store. Start with the habitat. Get it set up. Yeah. Make sure the parameters are dialed in. Then add the animal to it. Yeah, I think like, that's such a cool way to go. Yeah. I mean, and it makes a lot of sense in so many different other respects too. You know, like yeah, this like like if you're doing a bioactive setup, like cycling the tank well and like getting yeah. it nicely established, getting your plants exactly. established, all that stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like, yeah, I think it's just it's just a helpful way to kind of slow down the process especially because it's really easy to get baby reptiles and Mm -hmm. that are very easy to house when they're small that then inevitably become adult reptiles (laughs) yeah yeah it's yeah it's true it's it's one of the reasons like one of the reasons as this as a store like my rule is for lizards we won't we won't sell any lizards that get bigger than two feet adult Mm -hmm. and then we won't sell any snakes that get bigger than five feet adult because mm-hmm. time and time again, folks get like a, a monitor that's going to like top out at six feet. And they're like, and at the time it's like that big. And they're like, yeah. And then it oh, hits yeah. like three feet and they start sweating and they're like, it needs to go. Someone came in yesterday 
and told me a story about a friend in California who had a kimono dragon. Oh my and God. yeah, and she turned it over. She, had, she turned it over to a rescue and she was like, look, I'm going to turn this over to you, but there's rules. You can't ask me how I got it, where I got it from. None of that. <laughs> so I, I was like, are we not allowed yeah, to have yeah, kimono yeah, dragons yeah. here? I'm assuming maybe not. we're like, yeah, highly. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm skeptical to say the least that it even was one because they're yeah. so oh, no, they're so rare. And definitely, yeah, rare and definitely, activity, it but... definitely was. And oh my like God, her, that's crazy. like apparently her husband brings so like she showed me some pictures of, and I was like, oh, wow. okay. So she got her hand somehow on a wild caught kimono dragon. Wow. And then it it just like and it had like a she had it set up like she said the enclosure was she said it was like as long as this area in my store and that is about fifteen feet so it was yeah. like a fifteen feet by like like you know big enclosure yeah. but it uh, it it broke it had tempered glass and it broke the tempered glass oh, <laughs> and wow. like and got out and so it started like stuff like that started happening and she's like i can't i cannot keep i cannot keep this lizard it's just like yeah. and then it was like she also has like chickens and stuff and it was like hunting down the chickens <laughs> and like she was just like I can't like so she so she moved it on to a rescue but she was like before like you like wow. no you can't just like just no questions i don't want to get any trouble it just we can't it has to it has to go so it, wow. it got moved on to a rescue but they also apparently have other things we're also not allowed to have but we don't i'm not gonna get into that <laughs> yeah so. i mean there's a lot of that out there i feel like yeah i don't know i, I it's, on the large reptiles thing i think that's really smart i think about like just mm -hmm. like back in like the 90s like when i was like yeah. a little oh. kid keeping reptiles like how many people were like mm -hmm. i'm gonna go get a nile monitor for my first pet reptile <laughs> you know or like a green iguana yeah and it's like this oh kid gosh, those, one, like, of, one of my like, regulars well, we really done a better job <laughs> one of my regulars <laughs> this little kid who comes in he's really sweet and he came in a couple of weeks ago and he's like i got a nile monitor and i was like Mikey, you got a what? He's like, I got a now monitor. And I'm like, dude, do you know how big they get? Like you, he's like, yeah, no, I know, I know. And so we had this whole conversation around like how huge of a responsibility this is. And I'm just like, oh man, dude, it's that's because he's, he's, that's a whole thing. Uh, he's 12. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So yeah so he's 12 wild. years old so and he like he his he has the right mindset you know like his like his brother keeps and breeds bearded dragons his older brother and he's just like man i keep telling my brother like he's making his brother wants to make he wants to breed two leatherbacks and i'm like no like he <laughs> wants to intentionally make silkies and I'm mm, like, yeah. no. and he says, I keep telling him, he's like, I keep telling my brother, like, no. And, and he's like, he just doesn't want to listen to me. And he, and he came in and he's like, but you know, he's like, in the like, chat is like, no. <laughs> yeah, seriously. You know, and like, I, and I, and he's like, I keep telling my brother, no, don't do that. And Mikey's super cute. He's like, he's like, you know, I have like people, he says, like, I do my research and like, I have you to give me information, do my heart. Like, I was like, my heart. When he was like, like, I have you. And I was like, you do have me, little buddy. Like, so but sweet. when he came in here and told me he got a now monitor, I was like, oh my God, Mikey. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is a huge undertaking you're, you're getting yourself into. So yeah, like, I just, I don't, I don't want, I don't want this store to be a part of the problem, you know, mm -hmm. and like selling large reptiles like that. Like there are folks that are really responsible, large reptile keepers there. They exist. And like, I'm friends with some and, you know, like, and, but a lot of people don't realize how big three feet, four feet, they don't realize how big that actually is until the animal yeah. is three feet, five feet. And they're like, holy shit what did i do <laughs> you know yeah. so yeah which also this but, actually just reminded me of another thing i wanted to talk to you about because i was just thinking like like 
I, I feel like that with like the Spilodes, you know, we've talked about that before. Mm-hmm. Like these are snakes that get big, you yeah. know, and like part of the reason why like, like at Pomona, I brought my big male. So people are like, they have a visual reference. Like this is how big this snake is going to get, you know, for people. Yeah. But mm-hmm, exactly. like, um, because it's like the babies, it's just, it's just hard to like, like I can tell people like this snake is going to get up to maybe 11 feet long and weigh, you know, 10 pounds yeah. and, yeah. and like, it's going to need a lot of space, um, and all of that, but like, it's a different thing to actually see it. But, um, yeah. I really like the way that you approach shows and I'm curious if you could talk mm-hmm. a little bit about like how you, like how oh, you do shows, yeah. you know, and like, mm-hmm. and how you do animal sales at shows, like on, just on our last episode, um, mm-hmm we we were just talking to somebody about about shows and just kind of like how complicated it can be so i'm curious yeah. if you you'd explain yeah. a little bit about how you do it so i have a like i have like a a no animal cells rule for us with the way that we do shows so we only we only bring like dry goods care supplies and stuff like that and like we focus on getting folks set up with what they need and the information that they need to care for the animals. And some, like, we'll do, so we'll, we'll do, like, some small things. Like, the, at Pomona, we had, like, vampire crabs. And, like, we had, like, some Pac-Man frogs. And, like, in setups that they could go home and live in. Um, mm-hmm. And so we'll do stuff like, we'll do, like, little stuff like that. Um, I want to experiment in the future with doing, like, only pre-sales. And, Mm -hmm. but that's like complicated to navigate, you know, and I have thought about the idea of like, oh, what if we only bring, like, what if I bring like seven jewel assertives? So then that way, like I could handle really vetting those seven people that buy them to make sure that they are, they know what they're doing when they take these animals home, you know? And, but like, for the most part, it's like, we focus on education. Folks come to us. They're like, I just bought this bearded dragon. And then we unfortunately end up being the people that let them know, great. You bought that bearded dragon for $60. Now let me tell you about the $400 worth of supplies you need. And some folks are like, holy shit. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And then some folks are like, for the most part, just about everyone that like didn't realize this is what they were getting themselves into with needing the like enclosure that's big enough and the lighting and all of that other stuff and the supplements and the things they didn't know about. Like some folks are like, Oh, holy shit. Like, what did I do? And then like other folks are like, um, okay, all right, get me set up. I'm ready, like, mm-hmm. get me set up. And then some folks are like, oh, I'll get, they'll want to pick and choose what they want to get here and there. And like, those are always really heartbreaking for us because mm-hmm. like, they're like, oh, like, okay, like I'll get the light, but I'm not going to get the calcium. And I'm like, well, you might as well not get the light. <laughs> if yeah. you're not going to get the calcium. Like these things need to be together. Like this mm-hmm. light and this calcium, they need to be together, you know? And like, it's like, we really, for the folks that are really like, they don't want to invest the way that they need to, then we, we kind of fight like hell to get them to at least get the bare minimum, which is mm-hmm. the supplements the correct heat and the correct UVB. Like this is the bare minimum of what you need to get, make sure you get for these animals, you know? So we focus and we focus on, we like to say they have the animals. We have all the things you need so you don't kill them. (laughs) So yeah, that's how we, that's how we've been approaching it. And like, it could like, I don't know what that would look like in the future. Like trying to like do actual animal sales, but it's just like, I love, like sincerely love all these animals that I'm producing. And like, I want to make sure that they're going to a good home. Like it kind of, it really boggles me that someone can like pair, pair animals together, incubate eggs for like one, one month to a year, depending year plus, depending on the species, and then like raise up these little babies so that they're healthy and strong and big enough to go to other homes. 
and then like not care about the homes that they're going into, you know? So mm-hmm. I don't know. That's I get off, I'm gonna get off my soapbox, but yeah, it really bothers me. So that's how we approach those. And it's, and it works well for us because like dry goods, like we always have good shows. Like you always, you're always going to have a good show with dry goods. It's just mm-hmm. like, it's not going to be like a, I don't know, $20,000 show <laughs> or like 400,000, yeah. like what was that aid it or whoever, like, it's never going to be that, but it's all like, I, we always, it's always like a good show in my opinion, you know? So, yeah, yeah. that's great. I mean, I think that's a really cool way to approach it and yeah. Yeah. Lots of respect for that. Yeah. And we could, we probably could make more money if we had animals there, but I'm just not willing I'm just not willing to do that until I have a good, until I have a good way to make sure that I can properly vet folks and, and folks appreciate it. Like even with like, with Morph Market, like vetting the customers ahead of time, like folks are like, like, thank you for doing that. And, you know, so I was nervous about it at first, like vetting people, but I'm just like, no, like if they don't want to be vetted, then they're not my customer base, you know? Yeah, so, totally. And I'm, and I'm fine so what with that, that. What does that process look like for you? Like, like, like say mm-hmm. it's on Morph Market, like, is it just kind of asking some questions about, like, how they have their, their stuff set up? Or, like, what does it look like? Yeah, so it's, it's a conversation. Like, I ask them, it starts with me asking them to send over photos of the enclosure that they're going to keep them in as well as the and photos of the lighting that they have there. So mm-hmm. we start there, like that seems to be the best icebreaker. And then mm-hmm. it evolves into a, com- a conversation about supplements. Like they send those photos over and like, I either like say it looks good or I give them feedback on things that they need to change. And then, um, or ask questions if I can't fully tell what they have going on there. And then uh, I'll, and I'll say like, you know, what about, you know, what about feeders? You know, what are you planning to feed them? And so then I can get a gauge if they understand the imperson- the importance of like diverse diets. And then I go into supplements and I'm like, you know, are you familiar with uh, supplementation and gut loading? And like, that's usually where fo- like I'll get folks that are like, oh, like gut loading, what is that? And we'll talk mm-hmm. about that. And And then we'll talk about the different supplements that they need. And I tell them how I do supplements. So it's like a conversation that we have. And like, at like any point, like say so far it has, I haven't hit any points where folks are like, oh, like they have the wrong lighting. And, but if we were to hit that and they have the wrong lighting, then I would say, okay, like I, this is what I need you to do before we can move forward. Uh, Mm -hmm. You just, you need to switch out to the correct lighting or I can sell you the correct lighting along with Mm -hmm. the reptile and I can send it out. I can ship it out with you, like ship it out to you when we ship out everything else, you know? So, and then like the folks that don't want to be vetted, like when I ask, when I ask them to send over photos, like they'll just fall off and like not reply and stuff like that. So, and I'm like, I'm, I'm totally fine with that, you know? So so yeah, that's, that's what the process has looked like so far. And, and I think it also helps establish a good rapport with folks. So like the folks that have purchased from me so far, like they've been sending me like updates and like telling me how it's going, like unsolicited updates. And I really love that. And, and anything like that helps kind of build a relationship, like with the person, like I, I'm all for that. So for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think it's so a good way too I, to like actually have, oh wait, go ahead. I have, I need to get my charger. I'm at, okay. I'm at, I'm at 2%. <laughs> give, okay. me, give me a second. I, I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> go for it, go for it, go for it. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, I just remembered that you're still in my ear. I guess we could still be talking. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, well, I mean, honestly, we're at, we're at an hour 45 almost. So I think it's probably good to, <laughs> start moving to the closer yeah anyway but um so which is something i would definitely i definitely want to hear from you i know i know you know what's coming so i do (laughs) for you summer winston of the shop (laughs) why herpetoculture (laughs) oh no i think it just froze for a sec it's oh i think 
we lost Summer for a sec, but let's get them back momentarily. Here they are. Sorry, can you hear me? No, you're good. Yeah, 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 I can hear you. That's great. You're back. I'm sorry about that. I was trying to check to make sure that it's actually charging, and I accidentally like refreshed the whole page. <laughs> That's cool. It's no okay. big deal. Why have pediculture? Okay. So let's see. Like I, I've heard so many people answer this question, and I like for whatever reason have thought about what my answer would be to that question. And now in the moment I'm freezing, like, what is my answer? <laughs> Why have pediculture? And okay. So I, one. so one, like, like I'm a really curious person by nature. And I think at least for me, a part of what it looks like to be a good hepatoculturalist is to be like infinitely curious, like to want to mm. like just learn and wrap your mind around the needs of these animals. And like that part is really satisfying for me, like on a logistical level, like just getting to be like having this hobby that lets me be as big of a geek in fact, requires me to be like as big of a geek as I can be in order to get it right, you know, and mm -hmm. it keeps me, it really keeps me on my toes in a way that's exciting, but also can be devastating and heartbreaking. Like my giant butterfly agamas, like I really struggled once I moved them from their smaller quarantine enclosures to their mm -hmm. bigger one, I really struggled to get their parameters correct. And I ended up losing two of my babies, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it was really, it could be really devastating. So it's in a lot of ways, it's like this emotional roller coaster that like makes me feel really alive. <laughs> and I love that, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then like the other, the other side of it also is just that like cultivating community is really important to me and like education is really important to me as well. Oh. Where'd it go? Uh-oh. Hmm. May I? Uh-oh. We almost made it to the end. <laughs> I'll try one more time here to get this last question. Let's see if I can message Summer. I think that I think that Summer's um, phone may have died, so I'm gonna call it here. But um, just want to encourage everybody to give Summer a follow on Instagram and social medias. They're at the shop. That's T H E S H A P. And um, yeah, check out what they're doing with just with with their their store. It's amazing. You're gonna be blown away that they did all of that by themselves in the way that they did. It's really impressive and obviously they're up to some really cool stuff so give them a follow and thanks to everybody who tuned in 
for the podcast listeners, this will be hopefully sufficient. Good night, everybody. Thank you.